On January 7th, GSAP featured this site as their site of the day. The site explores a lot of solid animation ideas throughout, but what really caught my attention was the way how the navigation is treated as part of the layout, not just a fixed header. As soon as you land on the page and start scrolling, this frame block begins to expand, pulling the navigation links along with it as it grows toward the full viewport. At the same time, the logo scales down and settles into the center of the navigation bar. Once the animation reaches its end state, the navigation pins itself in place, creating space for the rest of the site content to scroll through underneath. It's a really thoughtful interaction and not something I've seen implemented this way on any other sites before. So I thought this was worth exploring and breaking down how a transition like this can be built using GSAP. Over the weekend, I put together this small scroll-based experiment that recreates the same core idea, focusing on the expanding navigation frame and the logo transition. For this demo, I'm using a static image as a background, but this could easily be swapped out for a video, like a showreel or motion loop. In this video, I'll show you how to build this menu concept using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, powered by GSAP scroll trigger and flip. If you find these kinds of rebuilds helpful, make sure you leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you'd like to access the source code for this project, along with hundreds of other similar micro projects and a brand new website template every month, you can check out the pro membership via the link in the description. Alright, let's jump into the code. First, I'll create a wrapper called Navbar Backdrop. This element is going to set fixed behind everything else and it's mainly responsible for the visual framing of the navigation area. Inside the backdrop, the first thing I'll add is the navbar image. This simply holds a single image element. The idea here is that this image always lives behind the navigation frame, giving the layout some depth while everything else animates on top. Next, still inside the navbar backdrop, I'll add another empty div called navbar background. This element doesn't contain any content, it is just there purely as a shape. Later on, we'll animate its width and height using scroll and this is what creates that expanding frame effect as the navigation transitions into a full viewport layout. Now that the backdrop is set up, I'll move on to the actual navigation content. For that, I'll create a new wrapper called Navbar Items. This element holds everything interactive, the links and the logo, and it sits on top of the background frame we just created. Inside Navbar Items, I'll first add two groups of navigation links. Each group uses the class Navbar Links, and inside each one, I've got a couple of anchor tags with some placeholder text. Splitting the links into two separate groups gives us more control over spacing and alignment later on especially when the frame starts expanding and stretching across the screen. After the links, I'll add the logo. This lives inside a navbar logo wrapper and inside that, I'll place a single anchor tag containing an image. This logo is going to play an important role in the animation. It starts out positioned toward the bottom of the frame and later on, it will scale down and move into its pin position as part of the scroll transition. With the navigation structure in place, we can now move on to the main page content. First, I'll add a section with the class hero. Inside this section, I'll place a single h1 with some placeholder text. This hero section is positioned further down the page. And finally, I'll add one more section with the class about. Just like the hero, this section contains a single h1 with some additional placeholder text. This section exists mainly to give us scroll length. So once the navigation finishes its transition and pins into place, there is enough content for the page to scroll naturally underneath it. And that's all we need for the HTML. Next, we'll move on to the CSS and start shaping how this frame actually looks and behaves visually. First, I'll bring in two fonts from Google Fonts. One of these is a condensed typeface that we'll use for the large headings. The other is a clean grotesque font that works well for navigation links and smaller interface text. Next, I'll define a couple of color variables at the root level. One will act as our light base color and the other will be used for text and contrast across the layout. After that, I'll reset all the default browser styles. I'll remove margins and paddings everywhere and make sure every element uses border box sizing. Now I'll set up the base styles for the page. I'll apply the light background color to the body and set the default text color. For images, I'll make sure they always fill their containers and crop themselves cleanly. Next, I'll style the main headings. All H1 elements will be uppercase, bold, and tightly spaced using the condensed font. This gives the headings a strong editorial presence that holds up even while the layout is animating. Then I'll style the anchor tags. I'll keep them minimal, remove default text decoration, and use the grotesque font. The goal here is to make the links feel structural rather than decorative. Now let's start shaping the navigation layout. I'll position both the navbar backdrop and the navbar image as fixed elements that fill the viewport. 
and also disable pointer events on them so they behave purely as visual layers. This lets the backdrop and image set behind everything else without interfering with interaction. Next, I'll position the navbar background and navbar items in the center of the screen. Both of these elements will share the same size and aspect ratio. Together, they form the frame block that will animate as the user scrolls. I'll also add a will change hint here to prepare these elements for smooth width and height updates later on. Now I'll style the navbar background. This is just a solid block of color that defines the visible shape of the frame. It doesn't hold any content, it simply expands and contracts during the scroll animation. Then I'll move on to the navbar items. I'll turn this into a flex container and space the children apart horizontally. This is where all the interactive navigation elements live, layered above the background frame. Next, I'll style the logo. I'll position the navbar logo toward the bottom of the frame and center it horizontally. I'll give it internal spacing so the logo feels balanced within the frame. I'll also enable pointer events here since the logo is interactive. There is a second state for the logo called navbar logo pinned. When this class is applied, the logo shifts from the bottom of the frame to the top. This represents the final layout state once the frame is fully expanded. We won't animate this position directly in CSS. Instead, we'll let GSAP handle the transition using flip. The class simply defines where the logo should end up. For the logo image itself, I'll make sure it scales proportionally without stretching. Now, I'll style the navigation links. Each nearby links group will take up half of the available space and use Flexbox to distribute the links evenly. I'll add a symmetrical padding to the two groups. This creates a balanced layout inside the frame and leaves clear space in the center for the logo. With the navigation styled, I'll move on to the page sections. I'll center the content inside all sections using Flexbox to align the content both vertically and horizontally. Text is centered, overflow is hidden, and the stacking order ensures everything sits above the background layers. Next is the hero section. I'll add some vertical spacing and push it further down the page. This delay is intentional. It ensures the navigation frame has time to expand and settles before the main content scrolls into view. Depending on how tall your hero content is, you may need to adjust the spacing. The goal is simply to line up the end of the frame animation with the start of the hero section. The about section is simpler. I'll make it fill the viewport so there is no scroll length once the navigation is pinned. For both the hero and about headings, I'll limit their width on larger screens. This keeps the text readable and prevents it from stretching too wide. Finally, I'll add some responsive adjustments for smaller screens. On mobile, the navigation frame stretches the full width and layout switches to a vertical flow and spacing is simplified. The logo also aligns to the left instead of staying centered. The hero section behaves differently as well. It fills the viewport directly instead of being pushed down the page. This keeps the experience clean and usable on smaller screens without forcing the same desktop interaction. And that's it for the CSS. At this point, the layout is fully set up and ready. Next, we'll move into the JavaScript and start firing up the scroll driven animation logic. I'll start by importing everything we need. I'll bring in GSAP as the base animation library. Then I'll import scroll trigger since we are tying the entire transition to scroll progress. I'll also import flip because we want the logo to move between layout states without feeling like it jumps. And finally, I'll import Lenis so we can run the scroll with a smoother, more consistent feel. Once those imports are in place, I'll register the plugins. I'll register scroll trigger and flip with GSAP, which basically tells GSAP that we plan to use those features in this project. Next, I'll set up Lenis. I'll create a new Lenis instance, connect it to scroll trigger, and whenever Lenis reports a scroll update, I'll trigger scroll trigger to update as well. This keeps the scroll linked animation feeling direct and stable, especially when the browser drops frames or the tab loses focus. Now, before we write the actual scroll animation logic, I'll set up the structure for it. I'll create a function called initialize navbar animations. This is where all the navbar animation setup will live. The reason I'm wrapping it in a function is because we'll need to run this logic more than once, especially after a resize and we want a clean way to reinitialize everything. Just so we can keep the flow clear while building this step by step, I'll jump to the bottom of the file for a moment. We'll come back and fill the initialize navbar animations function right after this. So next, I'll add a DOM content loaded event listener. This ensures all the elements exist in the DOM before we try to select them or animate anything. Inside this callback, the first thing I'll do is call initialize navbar animations that kicks off the initial setup as soon as the page is ready. Then, I'll set up a resize handler. I'll create a timer variable first and then listen for the window resize event. Whenever the user resizes the screen, I'll clear the existing timer and set a new one. This gives us a simple debounce so we don't consistently rebuild animations while the resize is still happening. Once that timer fires, I'll do three things. First, I'll kill any existing scroll trigger instances. 
That's important because scroll trigger stores internal measurements and those can become inaccurate after a resize. Next, I'll reselect all the key navbar elements, the background frame, the item wrapper, the link groups and the logo. Then I'll clear any inline styles that Gsa previously applied. This resets everything back to its clean CSS state so we don't stack transforms or widths from a previous run. I'll also remove the navbar logo paint class from the logo. That way, the logo goes back to its original layout position before we calculate a new flip state. And finally, I'll call initialize navbar animations again. So every time the viewport changes, we fully reset the animation and rebuild it using the updated dimensions. Now that this outer structure is in place, we can go back up and start filling in the actual logic inside initialize navbar animations where the scroll expansion and the flip transition happens. The first thing I'll do inside this function is grab references to all the elements we are going to animate. I'll select the navigation background frame, the wrapper that holds the navigation items, both groups of navigation links and the logo. These are the core pieces that make up the frame and we'll be updating all of them as the user scrolls. Next, I'll check whether we are on a desktop size screen. I'll do this by comparing the current viewport width against a breakpoint and storing the result in a flag. This lets us branch the logic early and avoid running complex scroll animations on smaller screens. If we are not on desktop, I'll handle that case right away. I'll add the paint class to the logo so it jumps straight into its final layout position. Then I'll set a fixed width on the logo and force both the navigation background and the navigation items to fill the viewport. In this mode, there is no scroll driven expansion at all. The navigation simply starts in its end state. Once that's done, I'll return out of the function because we want to prevent any of the desktop only calculations or scroll trigger logic from running on smaller screens. Now, assuming we are on desktop, we can start preparing the values we'll need for the scroll animation. First, I'll grab the current viewport width and height. We'll use these as the target dimensions for the expanding frame once the animation reaches its end state. Next, I'll measure the initial width and height of the navigation background. This represents the frame's starting size before any scroll happens. I'll also loop through each group of navigation links and record their initial widths. This gives us a snapshot of how wide each link group is and its resting layout, which we'll use later to smoothly interpolate them during the expansion. With all those measurements in place, I can now prepare the logo transition. Before changing anything visually, I'll capture the current layout state of the logo using Flip. This snapshot tells Flip exactly where the logo is positioned before we move it. Then I'll add the pink class to the logo, which switches into its final layout position at the top of the frame. I will also apply fixed width to the logo so its size remains consistent during the transition. I'll create a flip animation from the captured state, disable easing and pause it. This gives us a controllable transition between the logo start and end positions, one that we can manually drive using scroll progress in the next step. With that setup, the logo is now ready to move smoothly as the frame expands. Next, we'll connect all of this to scroll trigger and start driving the entire transition using scroll. I'll create a new scroll trigger instance and use the navigation backdrop as the trigger. This means the animation starts as soon as the page begins scrolling and it runs for the length of one viewport. I'll enable scrubbing so the animation stays directly tied to scroll progress. There is no easing here, the scroll position itself controls everything. Inside the update callback, I'll grab the current scroll progress. This gives us a normalized value between the start and end of the trigger and we'll use this single value to drive the entire transition. First, I'll update the size of the navigation frame. Using the apps interpolate utility, I'll smoothly blend the frame's width and height from their initial values to the full viewport. I'll apply this to both the background layer and the navigation items so they always stay perfectly aligned as the frame expands. Next, I'll update the navigation links. I'll loop through each link group and interpolate its width based on the same scroll progress. This keeps the links evenly spaced as the frame stretches, preventing any snapping or layout shifts during the transition. Finally, I'll update the logo animation. Instead of playing a timeline, I'll manually set the flip animation's progress using the same scroll value. This way, the logo movement stays perfectly in sync with the frame expansion and the link adjustments all driven by a single scroll input. At this point, the entire navigation transition is controlled by scroll, the frame expands, the links adjust and the logo settles into place as one continuous motion. And that wraps up the JavaScript for this interaction. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.